Welcome to this Cell and Gene Therapy Insights and Milteni Biotech Expert Roundtable, discussing the potential and challenges of extracellular vesicles for therapeutic applications and research. This roundtable discussion will be moderated by Stefan Wild, Senior Scientist R&D at Milteni. Joining Stefan today are three leading experts in the field. Tony de Fugerol is CEO of Evox Therapeutics, a company that's engineering exosomes to deliver protein and nucleic acid-based therapeutics to treat rare diseases. Joanna Correa is CEO of Exogenous Therapeutics, which is using extracellular vesicles derived from umbilical cord blood cells to deliver therapies for wound healing. And finally, Joshua Welsh is a research fellow at the NIH, where he's exploring the potential of extracellular vesicles as a method for cancer diagnosis and for predicting treatment prognosis. So now let's hand over to our moderator, Stefan, to get the roundtable started. Hello and welcome to our today roundtable discussion on extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles are important means of intercellular communication secreted by cells. EVs uh, are covered by membranes and carry proteins as well as nucleic acids. EVs can target cells and therefore are interesting for diagnostic as well as therapeutic purposes. Today, we will discuss challenges and the potential use of extracellular vesicles. The first question we would like to address is what is driving the driving growth interest in, what is driving the growing interest in extracellular vesicles for use in therapeutic applications and research? Where are we now? And what's next for this area? So maybe Joanna, you would like to start? Hi, um, so thanks for the invitation for this discussion. Um, I'd be happy to share my, my expertise, my experience in the field. Uh, where are we now? Well, um, Exogenous has been founded seven years ago uh, and of course, back then, there were only a handful of companies worldwide exploring extracellular vesicles as a therapeutic um, tool. Nowadays, the, the field has totally changed. We see many companies uh, working in the field, very um, good companies already reaching the clinic. So I think that uh, at the moment, we are in the turning of, the, of this uh, new field of therapeutics. Uh, of course, diagnostics has its own a pace and it's it's going fast uh, the use of extracellular vesicles for diagnostics uh, and so what i think is that uh, although this is a quite challenging scientific area uh, that it still has some um, bottlenecks that we'll discuss later on i'm sure uh, it's a very interesting time to be working in the field and i have been observing this uh, for some years now and i'm very excited to be observing uh, extracellular vesicles reaching the clinic nowadays so i uh, hope we'll get there soon why is there more interest in, in EVs or exosomes? I think if you look at, if you want the revolution that's occurred in the last 10, 15 years with genetic medicines, and if you think of R and interference, MR and A, gene editing, gene therapy, um, you know, all of those have now developed to a point where actually making the drug is no longer a, a, the main issue. It, it is, all, all of those technologies suffer from a difficulty in how do they deliver those payloads, drug payloads safely, effectively to other tissues. I mean, most of those are only really effective in, in one cell type. I mean, you know, having developed the LMPR and the eye technology, well as the alnylam, that works really well, but it only works for hepatocytes. And likewise at Moderna, we developed MR and they, and, 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 and did all of that, but it's only really largely being used in a vaccine context. So if you think of all of these great innovations they are being held back by an inability to effectively safely deliver. And I think lipid nanoparticles are clearly one option. There's a lot of work going on there, but I think what you're seeing are people also saying, well, how does nature do, do this? What are, the means that, that cells use to communicate and deliver payloads. It could be proteins, R, and they molecules, whatever. And 
you know, people are saying, well, let's let's look at that. Let's let's explore that. And I think as our knowledge of of exosome EV biology expands, we're we're now able, at least from an EVOX perspective, you know, where where I'm at now, we're really using uh, that knowledge to load all of these drug classes into exosomes and thereby deliver them to new tissues in a safe and non-immunogenic way. Thank you very much. Josh, maybe you can give some more insights into the research field of extracellular vesicles, but what's going on there right now? Yeah, interest in EVs generally is growing at a huge rate. Uh, irrespective of application, but there's a huge body of literature now showing um, functional studies of EVs and their ability to uh, modulate uh, cells downstream and show, um, you know, ability to potentially deliver cargo. I think one of the, the things that's really helped facilitate it is the growing use of technology um, that allows people to detect EVs um, and, and sometimes naively so. Um, so this, this idea of EVs as um, therapeutics is, is going to be really important. And I think it's something that definitely is um, possible. We just need to be really careful that what we're quantifying is actually EVs. I think there are many uh, manuscripts uh, in, in the literature that show or say that EVs are the active uh, component of a functional study. And maybe it could be, you know, extracellular you know, RNA or proteins. Um, and this is kind of hindered. We're, we're going to have this uh, kind of fight now, really, within the therapeutic side and the functional side to demonstrate that EVs are the active component and not co-isolates with EVs. Um, and this is important, particularly when it gets to the therapeutic application, so that when we're trying to isolate, you know, that active component of a therapeutic, we don't have anything that's competing with it or could potentially have some uh, downstream adverse effects. Uh, with EVs as therapeutics. So there's huge interest and there's huge capabilities of EVs. I think it's just uh, a lot of a lot we need to do with the kind of technology side and, and proving that we're truly looking at EVs because it's a very tricky topic because we're down in the kind of 30 to 150 nanometer region for the vast majority of these EVs that are being loaded and used as therapeutics. Yeah, I think this is really an important topic and size is really a critical, critical point here because many technologies are, are at the limits uh, due to the smaller size of the extracellular vesicles. So if we compare the extracellular vesicles with cells or cell therapy, so cell therapy becomes now more and more popular. So where do you see the main difference or the advantages that might the, the, these extracellular vesicles have over cells? So Tony, maybe you would like to start here? Sure. And, you know, again, you know, just to build on kind of Joshua's point, I think the analytics are key, right? And I think the sorts of tools that we, from an industrial perspective, have at hand uh, do allow us very precise analysis of, you know, the EV populations, what, you know, where they are, and, and even how we load the drugs means that, you know, we kind of, in a lot of cases, genetically tied the EV to the drug itself, right? So, um, you know, in terms of EV versus cell therapy, I think obviously, you know, both can, can, can work well. I think EVs have, have the uh, advantage in that you can actually quantitate what you're going to be putting in as an active drug product. You can quantitate, you know, the number of EVs, the amount of active ingredient you have, right? You know, whereas cell therapy, a lot of that will happen uh, once it's injected into a patient, right? And you know, you know, and you know, that, that's not a problem. It's just a different way to look at it, right? So, um, you know, I think uh, both are useful. I think you know there are also a, a range of folks who have done cell therapy and are trying to substitute EVs for cell therapy. I'd say, you know, the the only concern there is getting a good understanding of what is the active ingredient that is actually either in the cells or in the EVs that you propose to put in there, right? And that's why, you know, we've always been very, very direct about and very deliberate in terms of how we approach it, where we're really 
engineering RxSomes or EVs to contain a specific drug of choice so that we really do know what the active ingredient is and we can quantify that. And all of that's very important from a drug development perspective. So just where, where do you see the main difference between cellular therapies and EVs? I do think, I mean, just to build on that point a little bit, I do think, you know, there are certain advantages to EVs where, you know, if you can engineer your drug cargo, you can put ligands on the surface of the EV to preferentially direct them to certain tissues. Um, you know, that's something that's, 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 you know, more difficult to do with cell therapy. And obviously, you know, we've also had a lot of success in loading and delivering a, a range of drug cargoes into the same EV, right? So if it's gene editing, we can put CAS proteins in with guide R and they into the same vesicle, um, you know, which is something that, uh, you know, would, would not really be possible uh, from a cell therapy perspective, particularly as those payloads, you know, need to be inside the recipient cell, right? So, so you know, they are kind of fundamentally doing different sorts of things. Difference between EVs and cellular therapies. So, where do you see the advantages uh, of EVs or of the cells? Um, okay, so. Um... Basically, of course, cell therapies have a lot of advantages. Then they have been typically developed to substitute or reconstitute uh, tissues in in a patient, and exosomes have come uh, came into into light uh, as an alternative uh, for several reasons. Some of them being, of course, being able to cross biological barriers due to their size and biochemical and biophysical characteristics. Uh, the potential of being less immunogenic, so they they wouldn't be. Um, involving the patient in, into harsh uh, reactions uh, of, of um, um, according to, to, the, to their immunologic uh, exacerbated reaction. And the possibility to also uh, being able to target uh, different tissues is also a good advantage that we have with exosomes that are uh, quite more difficult with cell therapies. We can, we can modify, engineer these EVs to be able to target specific tissues. So these are some of the advantages that we see um, in EVs and are less prominent in, in cells. Yeah, thank you very much. So initially, we already touched a few of the challenges of EVs. So where do you see the biggest hurdle currently we are facing in the EV research uh, on clinical applications? So is it purification? Are these more regulatory aspects? Is it a QC? Or I think we all agree that standardization is still um, required to be able to transfer from one lab to the other. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about this? Maybe, Joanna, you can continue. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of a lot to talk about in in the in some of the challenges, technical and and um, and even of application that we have at the moment. On the technical aspects, of course, purification is one of the is one of the um, more sensitive topics. Uh, there are a lot of uh, data, a lot of groups working in the field, and now we know much more than we did we did know uh, ten years ago. So, uh, but still, there are a lot of um, practicalities for the clinical application, there are, there are still uh, challenges for the industry, I believe. And of course, Tony can uh, comment a bit later on that, I'm sure. Um, then on, on the technique still, the, the fact that we, that, or the, the technologies to analyze, to standardize and to um, evaluate concentration of, of the active ingredient, if you want, for uh, final clinical products is still uh, under discussion for, from the regulators. So we, we need to find ways to really have this fixed and standardized to have good products, measurable products. And also, as Joshua already pointed out a bit, uh, on the biodistribution pharmacokinetics issue, this is uh, quite challenging still for the, um, for the clinical development of the products in the future. I think there are, there are some technical hurdles still that we need to, to face because of having totally, being totally sure that EVs are delivered uh, into certain uh, tissues is still um, a bit puzzling for, for science. Uh, so those are the technical aspects. And of course, regulatory wise, there are other um, aspects, but I'm sure Tony has more experience uh, than we do on this field. So maybe you can 
want to jump on that. Just to build on the point, in terms of the challenges, I think from a CMC perspective, I think the key things are downstream purification and the analytics, and they kind of go hand in hand, because as the analytic capability has improved, so is your ability to identify the EV population that you want to, to be able to characterize that. From a drug development perspective, the real key is making sure it's not so much how pure it is, but making sure that what you're delivering is reproducible and quantitated so, so that all of your preclinical studies, if, if it's PK, toxicology, et cetera, can really then be supportive of what you go into, into, into the clinic. So you really want to be able to show that your CMC process is reproducible and robust, right? And so I think that's really where the field has evolved over the last two or three years pretty dramatically. And, and I think we're at the point where those processes are very scalable. They are ready to go into the clinic, et cetera. Um, and, and I do think as a general field, you know, there is a there is a gap between how a lot of the academic researchers still quantify stuff and how folks who are developing it from an industrial perspective and perhaps have more capabilities or access to different capabilities kind of do it. So I think that's also a little bit of a challenge in the field in general. And I think someone alluded to that before, where you've got publications on e EVs where you know we don't have a complete sense as to well what was actually looked at, right? And so I think that's a challenge for the field more broadly is how do you standardize that kind of knowledge base? I think all of the above are really important. So just from the isolation point of view, um, a lot of people use differential ultracentrifugation, uh, and there's a platform for reporting how you isolated your EVs called EV Track. And that, the last time I checked, had over a thousand uh, different combinations of how someone performed differential ultracentrifugation to get their EV preps. So the, the, the state of the field is in complete heterogeneity <laughs> as to how we isolate our EVs and what the best way is. A lot of people now are starting to use a combination of methods. And there is no perfect method uh, from, from the research side. And some methods are better than others. And some can introduce artifacts. It's definitely been shown that you know you can isolate EVs two different ways and they can have different effects downstream. It seems to be that there can be subsets of EVs depending on the source of the EVs. Um, and this this is again all plays into therapeutics. You don't want to have a therapeutic that has a component that could potentially be um, inhibiting the effect that you want it to have or competing with it. And with you know the the standardization of characterization. Um, you know, there are no tools that can, you know, measure the diameter distribution of EVs in a high throughput fashion. They just don't exist yet. The standards at a metrological level don't exist yet for, for a lot of these techniques that we're using that are optically based. Um, and there's, there's a real, you know, effort in the field to push these forwards along with uh, metrology, metrology agencies like NIST. Um, there's some also standardization studies going on in Europe um, with um, metrology agencies to produce these standards so that our characterization methods can be standardized. And then we can start, as Tony says, once we you know, have better analytics, then we can you know, go back and reassess all of our things upstream. And it's kind of a repeating uh, process. Uh, but there's, there's a huge amount of work. And I, I wouldn't say there's any one thing because all of them uh, kind of have a knock-on effect to, to the others. Thank you very much. The engineering of EVs becomes more and more popular. So if you could uh, just wish what you would like to engineer, Tony, what would be, what would you change? What would you add as a feature for the EVs? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, you know, our approach to exosome or EV therapeutics is really, you know, not, you know, taking advantage of what nature has put there because obviously, you know, we've heard, you know, you know, they're quite efficient at delivering payloads. Uh, they tend to be non-immunogenic. So we're not trying to second guess nature per se. A range of those molecules are important in the EV biogenesis. And then important 
in the uptake of how you know how EVs are taken into cells, what pathways they get taken into, and so um, there are a range of those molecules that are going to be important for each of those steps. What we put in is tried to put in our drug, or in some cases our drug plus a targeting agent, etc. And so you know we found that that approach works really well. We find the rest of the things in the EV are largely unchanged when we do do that. So it, it does mean you have a pretty robust platform to be able to repeat that process for drug A, drug B, drug C without really changing the underlying platform nature of the EV per se. So I think what we would like to put in, I mean, we to be honest, we've been able to put in all the sorts of things that we want to put in, if they're ligands to cross the blood-brain barrier, if it's to target particular cells in vivo, if it's to load different types of drug cargoes, our NA cargo protein. Um, we've got cleavable linkers designed as well, where we can cleave, you know, load the cargo, but then have it released from the EV. So when it's delivered to the recipient cell, the, car, the drug is free to go wherever it needs to go in the cell cytoplasm. So, you know, I, I think to date, we've been able to do all the things that we'd want. Um, and so, um, you know, but, you know, that's the benefit of us having focused for four or five years just on the engineered exosome space. We have that whole toolbox designed and, you know, that's what we're basically applying. Very interesting. So, jo Joanna, what would you like to add to your EVs? Yeah, so our experience is a bit different from uh, AVOX uh, experience. We have uh, re we have been relying much more on on the marvelous field uh, and the potential of cells to do their job. So uh, we have been using and trying to identify uh, cells and matching with the needs for the disease. So uh, we, and then of course, finding and fine tuning the challenges that we can make to cells. And this can be uh, either in microenvironment or genetic challenges so that they can produce the EVs themselves with, with um, well, more potentially therapeutic EVs. Of course, this can um, overlap a bit with the approach of, of, uh, of EVOX, but we have been having a bit more of a, a natural um, uh, look into, into the field. Uh, and I do think that there is still a lot uh, to, to explore in, in the field, not only from human-derived EVs, but also from other organisms. I, I really believe that the field will, will move into that. Uh, we have been seeing, observing um, very interesting papers coming out on the potential of EVs derived from other organisms, fungi, bacteria, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that there's still a lot of room to grow um, in, in the field. What I think that um, modification or, or loading of molecules, if you want to call it engineering, let's call it like that, uh, of the EVs, I, I personally believe more in their potential as RNA therapeutic uh, vehicles. Uh, I do think that they will gain more space in that field. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's where we, we are heading uh, at the moment. Uh, and of course, that this has implications for whatever uh, disease you want to you talk about. So that's, that's our position at the moment. I think from... Uh... Even a QC point of view, uh, the ability to engineer EVs is, is going to be incredibly important and useful. And having, uh, you know, engineered proteins on the surface as positive controls that we can use as reference materials is going to be a great utility for the field. It's something that we currently lack where we can all go and buy the same population of EVs and characterize them however we want and then compare our unit, uh, our, our data. And this kind of gets back to the standard unit question and getting us all talking in the same units. Um, so the, the engineering, I think, uh, you know, traverses just the therapeutics. I think it's going to be really critical for the field to move forward in a, in a standard way and really compare apples to apples with all of the, the things that we're developing at a really fast rate. So we are now nearly at the end of the discussion. I would, in the end, uh, take a look into the future so what are your prediction about future clinical applications? And what do you think, how far are we from seeing this in reality? Maybe Josh, you can start. 
I personally would like to see far better just from a titration point of view, for example, um, knowing the concentration of EVs you're putting into a dose. At the moment, I can't think of a single particle technology, uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis, flow cytometry, um, resistive pulse sensing that can detect the full diameter distribution of EVs from you know, the majority of cell lines, which are kind of 30 to 150 nanometers with a modal point at around 50 nanometers. NTA isn't standardized um, and it, it can't detect most things below 100 nanometers in a, in a heterogeneous population. Resistive pulse sensing has a cutoff of kind of 60, 70 nanometers. And then flow cytometry, depending on what you're looking at, is kind of up in the 60, 70 nanometer region as well. So to me, these dosage are, are somewhat of a guess in their orders of magnitude. And I'd really like to see that at least uh, some standardization um, in quantitative units um, before that goes forward uh, at a clinical level, uh, just for kind of reliability, <laughs> because you don't want to be changing doses by orders of magnitude. Yeah, thank you very much for this insight. So Tony, do you think we are already there, already for clinical applications? Or how long do you think it will take to really get it to the patients? Yeah, no, so it's a good question. And look, I think this is an evolving thing, right? With every technology, you know, there's a version one of the technology, you know, and in the exosome case, we've got a variety of um, kind of products in trials at the moment, right? I think it's probably, if you count the academic and the industrial partners, you've got over a dozen different trials that are ongoing with exosomes. Some of them aren't that are engineered with specific drugs. Some of them aren't. Uh, so I think that is moving forward, right? And it's like every technology, um, you know, be it monoclonal antibodies or R and the interference, there are, there are versions of that tech technology. And, you know, I do think it can move ra relatively quickly, right? Um, and uh, so, but ultimately, you know, you're going to learn on, only by advancing things, learning, you know, as you go through the manufacturing process, the, the, the trials, the data that comes back from that, all of that becomes really important. You know, I think just to build a little bit on Joshua's point about how do you quantitate the EVs, you know, we, we kind of look at it a different way. We're quantitating the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient in our EVs, because that's ultimately what's driving our drug, right? So that for us is kind of irrespective of the EV dose. We still want to know that, but, you know, you know, you know that's one of the reasons we've gone more towards an engineered approach, because we can put our finger on exactly what the active drug is, how, how much of it there is there. But I think, you know, from a field perspective, you know, there are trials, you know, some, some of them look quite promising, uh, but it's, it's, it's going to be an evolving process, right? But that's true with every te technology. No, definitely. And I think we will see a lot of progress uh, during the next years. So Joanna, what would be your perspective? Um, let me just comment a bit on, on Tony's feeling about this. Uh, I do agree with, with Josh in, in many aspects, and I, I think that we still have challenges. And the fact that we look at the API or, or the molecule that we engineer into the exosomes is quite appealing, is more straightforward. But we cannot forget that ex extracellular vesicles are complex biological entities, and they do have their lipid shell, their protein content, the rest of the, of the RNAs that are there if you are putting into an RNA. So, I, we tend not to forget about that, and, and I, I do think that uh, focusing on the API and the molecule that is leading the, the therapeutic effect is, of course, the most essential part, but there are ways that we, we will always need to characterize in general what, what is, what is on, on top of that or, or basically around that. Um, so that's our, my opinion. Where are we heading, or uh, or the future from now? I'm quite happy with uh, with the development of the field, to be honest. And I must say that seven years ago, it was uh, it was very very interesting to start to be uh, in the in the first phase, in the first steps of, of technology development, industrially uh, wise. Uh, and but it was a field with with no critics or there were very, very few uh, uh, industries. So we were kind of feeling alone. And nowadays this does not happen.
happen, of course. Uh, but more than that, uh, I'm happy to see the, in, the big industry interest in the field. And I, I think that's one of the one of the key messages I, I'd like to leave here, because what has changed during the years is that now uh, pharmaceutical industries are more looking into exosomes as a solution for their needs. Uh, and this uh, what can bring exosomes to, to light and to the clinical to the clinical application. So I really think that we are uh, in the right direction. Uh, we all together and the scientific community is promoting that, uh, is giving generating good data, comparisons, pointing out the, um, the um, fragilities of the technologies which is also important but having the the interest from from pharmaceutical companies is very important and we have been lucky to have on board uh, just recently one of those uh and i, I think it really uh, relies on the potential of the dcvs to transform medicine so uh let's hope for the best and hopefully uh in some years from now we'll see patients being treated with with this uh, tool so you think Exocellular vesicles are taken more serious in our days as compared to 10 years ago. Much more. Absolutely. So thank you very much. I think this has been really interesting insights into the field of exocellular vesicles. Uh, and I hope it was interesting for everybody. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. <laughs>